Where Are You, Mr. Biggs? by Nelson S. Bond A Tale of Lancelot Biggs Originally published in Weird Tales, September 1941 Narrated by Tom Trussell We're supposed to be an Earth-Mars lugger, but when we got to Mars Central Spaceport, the bug powder there gave me this solargram from Terra. It said, Proceed Uranus immediately, pick up cargo gallium. So I shoved a frantic for the old man over the ship audio, and pretty soon he came lumbering up to my radio room, picking his teeth and scowling like a man with only a half a tummy full of victuals. It's a fine state of affairs, he snarled, when a skipper can't even finish his dinner in peace. Well, what's the matter now, Sparks? You seeing pink rhinoceroses again? Cause if you are... I'm not, I told him with quiet dignity, and they aren't pink rhinos. They're lavender lobsters, and anyway, I haven't had a drink for months. Or maybe it's since yesterday. Anyhow, here's the grief, and I gave him the wire. He read it. Read it, your Aunt Nelly. He screamed it out loud. Uranus, he bellowed, this crate make that trip. They must be stark staring mad. Them, I agreed, or me. Flip a coin. What shall I do, Skipper? Tell them we can't do it? Tell them, no, wait a minute. Cap Hansen's brow looked like a freshly ploughed field. I knew why. The Saturn is an old lugger, and by old I do mean ancient. It was built before the turn of the century, and by all laws of logic and reason should have been taken off the spaceways long ago. Only that Cap Hansen and our screwball first mate, Lancelot Biggs, had demonstrated time and time again, and in startlingly devious ways, that the old scow was still space-worthy. But if the Saturn were removed from active service, the chances were ten to one that Hansen would be junked with her, which was reason numero uno, and a damned good one, why the skipper couldn't risk refusing this order. "'We'll go, Sparks,' he said slowly. "'We've got to. But I could wring his scrawny neck blast his jets.' I didn't have to ask whom he meant. Scrawny neck would mean only one inmate of our void perambulating asylum. Lancelot Biggs, genius and crackpot, scarecrow and sage, and soon to become son-in-law of the skipper. I said, but why blame Biggs for this skipper? Is it his fault if the home office has gone squirrely? It is, grumbled Hansen savagely. I never should have agreed to let Diane marry him. He started this mess at my house. Colonel Brophy and him were having dinner with me, and Biggs told Brophy all about that new velocity intensifier he invented. I shuddered. You mean the gadget which got us all bollocked up in the negative universe, till Hank Cleaver came from the past to get us out? That's it. Well, he told Brophy about it, brag that it would make the Saturn the fastest ship in the either. And now, Hansen groaned, just because he shot off his big face, we've got to push this leaky old tin can to Uranus. I said consolingly, well, maybe everything will be all right, Skipper. I admit Mr. Biggs is a bit of a wacky pot, but he's pulled us out of plenty of tough spots before like the time he thwarted Red Hake and his pirate crew, and the time he beat the slipstream. Hansen stared at me somberly. Nope, I guess you ain't. You couldn't have. I said, which? Couldn't have what, sir? You mustn't have seen Mr. Biggs on this shuttle. It was the first time I'd realised it, but he was right. And that was funny, because Mr. Biggs and I were old buddies, we were bunkmates once, even. I said, Well, lift my graves. Come to think of it, I haven't. Why, Skipper? I guess maybe it's on account of his busy planning to get married so soon. Hansen made sounds like a man being garroted. 
Marriage. Don't talk to me about marriage. But what does marriage do to a man? Marriage, I replied promptly, makes the mayor go. Oh, uh, no, that's money, isn't it? I give up, sir. What? It's supposed, boiled Hansen, to make him settle down. Only it ain't. Not in Biggs's case. It's having just the opposite effect, making him flighty as a coot. Lancelot ain't been worth a tinker's dam on this trip. He can't do a single thing right. Remember our take-off, Sparks, from Long Island Port, the one where we lifted grabs two full minutes before schedule, I finished. Don't I just. I almost did a swan dive through the aft bulkhead. Why, did he? Mm-hmm. And he also plotted the course that took us nine degrees off trajectory. And he heaved the ship into a van maiden spiral by signalling for a double-jet port blast in mid-space. And he... Hansen paused, panting with wrath. But why go on? The point is, the very thought of marriage has ruined him. And we can't depend on him to help us with this assignment. And Uranus is a long way from here. A long way. I winced. I said, Look, Skipper, must you say it that away? With icicles in your voice, I mean? But orders is orders. We lifted grabs as commanded at 11.20 Martian constant time. That's 3x9 solar relative, and pointed our prow toward the spot in a space where, some billion and a half odd miles away, Uranus was lounging about a wan and distant sun like a gigantic snowball. That is, we attempted to point our prow in that direction. Cap Hansen's astrogation came a cropper on this problem. He called me to the control turret. He asked, Sparks, have you seen him? You mean Mr. Biggs? No, sir. Well, go find him. In the first place, none of us except him know how to chart to intersect Uranus's orbit. And in the second place, we don't know how to operate that crazy velocity intensifier of his and... and fretfully. And in the third place, I don't like this in the first place. So I made a tour of the ship and found him where I should have looked first, in his own cabin, raptly fondling a cabinet photograph of Diane Hansen, soon to be Biggs. He glanced up as I entered, and his phenomenal Adam's apple, an auricular escalator if I ever saw one, bobbed in greeting. Hello, Sparks, he said dreamily, and held out the picture for my inspection. She's lovely, isn't she? I said, don't look now, Mr. Biggs, but that cheery little noise you've been ignoring is the audio buzzer beside your elbow. It's for you. The skipper wants you topside. Biggs looked startled. Me? But there must be some mistake. I'm off duty until tomorrow morning. Guess again, I told him. It so happens that you are the only mug, I mean officer, around here who knows how to finagle that velocity intensifier of yours, so you're elected. After all, if we're going to Uranus... That got him. He popped off his hip pockets like a thunderbolt from the bluey. What? Uranus? OK, I said gloomily. And you, watch yours. I stared at him curiously, though. What's the matter? Didn't you know? No, of course not. But, but... His fluid larynx did handsprings. But I can't go to Uranus. I told her I'd be home in ten days. I said, then she'd better not hold her breath till you get there. You led with your chin, Lieutenant, when you told the President of our beloved corporation about your new invention. He'd decided to give it a workout. And as near as I can figure, this was what had been worrying me from the start, it will take us about ten months to get to Uranus, and another twelve to get back. But surprisingly, it was my dejection that snapped Biggs out of his. The impatient bridegroom look disappeared from his eyes, and he grinned. My goodness, no sparks! Don't you understand the operation of my velocity intensifier? I'm a bug pounder, I told him. I understand the space code, and dots and dashes, and ampies, and I know four languages. That's par for the course. It's really quite simple. 
My velocity intensifier is exactly what the name implies, a device that is attached to the hypertomic motors for the purpose of stepping up a normal velocity. It's based on the principle of energy conservation. A series of parallax condensers absorb all waste energy, pass it through multiple amplifiers, rotors, and... And all points west, I finished. Is a no-go, Lieutenant. That's one of the languages I don't talk. Give it to me in words of one syllable. How long will it take us to get to Uranus and back? Considering the mean distance of Uranus, answered Biggs quietly, as approximately 1,560,000,000 miles, and if we travelled at a hitherto normal rate of speed, 200,000 miles per hour, it should take us 7,800 hours, or 325 days, to reach there, and slightly longer to return to Earth. Ten months, I wailed. I knew it. But, continued Biggs proudly, with this velocity intensifier attachment, our potential speed is restrained by only one factor, the limiting velocity of light, or 186,000 miles per second. In other words, the Saturn is now capable of a top speed of more than 650 million miles per hour. I gasped. I said, huh? You mean, I said, the trip to Uranus will take only a little more than two hours? Biggs smiled complacently. Theoretically, yes. Actually, it will take somewhat longer. You see, we must allow time for acceleration, for a condensation charge to build up on our superchargers before setting the VI unit in operation, and for deceleration upon reaching our objective. Also, we are forced to remain below the limiting velocity as a measure of safety. Else, we must suffer another translation to the negative universe, as we once did before I learned how to control the intensifier. But we will make excellent time. Ninety-six hours should see us landing at New Oslo, and... His pale eyes lighted. And gracious, this is wonderful! Diane will be surprised. If they're going to let me use the VI unit, we'll return to Earth by way of Uranus in less time than it would ordinarily take to make the Earth-Mars shuttle. But only, I pointed out, if, when, and as you go make that gadget gadge, while we're gnawing the avoir de poix, Cap Hansen's up there biting his fingernails to the knuckle. So shall we join the laddies? So he patted Diane's picture goodbye, and we went. Like I figured, Hansen was practically meat for the loony bin by the time we reached the bridge. He manhandled Biggs avidly and propelled him to the plot table. Where have you been, Biggs? he demanded. No, don't tell me now. Get going on the figures. They don't make sense to me now, wise. And when do we turn on that thingamajig of yon? But where do you find him? Shut up, you blabbermouth. Don't you know better than to talk when a space officer is cogitating? Can I help, Biggs? The one-man word storm was deafening, but it didn't seem to faze Biggs. He plunked himself down at the pilot's desk, scribbled for a while, and came up with an orbit chart for second mate Dick Todd seated at the control board. Then he heaved a volley of orders over the audio to Chief Engineer Garrity, and that was that. He relaxed. The skipper said nervously, Is, is that all? That's all, sir, said Biggs. The old man looked dubious. I don't hear nothing unusual, he said. You will in a minute, said Biggs. Ah, there it goes now. And darned if it didn't. One minute my ears hummed with the familiar drone of the hypertomics. The next, a weird and piercing whine rose in high, shrill crescendo, torturing our eardrums for a brief instant until it lost itself in an oblivion of supersonic inaudibility. That was all. No moment of oppressive weight as if we were lifting grabs at extra G's. No thunderous bellow of rockets. No anything. The ship rode easily, freely. I must have looked disappointed. To Biggs, I said. Too bad, sir. Eh, Sparks? Too bad it didn't work, I said. Biggs chuckled. But it did work, Sparks. We're now travelling at a speed in excess of 500 million miles per hour. Cap Hansen gulped and looked green, 
F five? That's right, sir. If you don't believe me, take a peek through the view panes. I moved to the forewall, slid back the metal slide that covered the quartzite view pane. Space lay before us. But what space? Not the dark, velvety pall, brightly agleam with an infinitude of starry jewels that all spacemen know. This was a blotched, striped, crazy quilt of colour, crimson, ochre, emerald, all the hues of the rainbow, of the aurora. It was beautiful, in a mad, fantastic way. There was a fairy, magic loveliness to that swift streaming space that fascinated and at the same time chilled me with dread. Hansen's eyes bulged, and his voice was fearful. We've, we've done it again, Biggs. Busted clean out of our universe into something else. No, sir, this is our universe. But we are seeing it as no man has ever seen it before. Our speed is so great that we are seeing the landmarks of space with a distorted viewpoint. Our relationship, or should I say relativity, is no longer to Earth or any of its sister planets, but to the greater constant, the fundamental motion of the universe itself. Thus, at one and the same time, we see the planets as they are and as they were. They are no longer mere points in space, they are streaks of colour. And he grinned. The stars, too, pretty, aren't they? Cap Hansen made a weak motions at the viewpane. Close it, Sparks, it's giving me the memes. So if you're right, Biggs, then what? How do we know when we get to Uranus, or near it, if it's just a streak of colour? You must reconcile yourself to an entirely new system of astrogation. Up to this time, pilots have just jetted along until they found their goal, then set course for a landing. But with the VI unit in operation, we fly blind and set our course by strict mathematical figuring. I have given Mr. Todd a plot chart. Four days hence, when I cut out the VI unit and return to normal operation of the hypos, we will find Uranus immediately beneath us. And now, if you'll excuse me... Wait a minute, said the skipper. Suppose we was to meet up with something in space, like a rogue asteroid. Biggs shrugged. That hazard is neither heightened nor decreased, he said. Our monitor beams will still shut off the smaller ones. As for the larger, well... You know as well as I that we have never yet found a method of overcoming that danger. It is one of the chances we take when we don space blues. As far as I'm concerned, I'd just as soon not see it coming as to watch it grow larger and larger in the perilens. Well, he was right there. So since Hansen was fresh out of questions, Biggs hoisted Hips back to his quarters. My guess is that he went back to Billy doing with Diane's picture. What's yours? I could build this up if I wanted to, and offer you a blow-by-blow -blow account of what happened in the next quarter of days. But why bother? The truth is, nothing did. The VI unit continued to chug along like a dream. Our old crate went flashing through space like a quantum with a hot date. Tempers squirmed. And me... I was in seventh heaven. I don't mean fifth or sixth either. This was the easiest shuttle I had ever made. We were travelling so fast, and the VI unit surrounded the Saturn with such a force field that my radio was utterly useless. So I got a vacation with pay. I ate and slept with what you might call monotonous regularity, and I spent all of my waking hours curled up with a good i.e. torrid book. And at the end of four days, Mr. Biggs disconnected his VI unit as called for on his plot chart, and just like he said, there was Uranus gleaming beneath us. So we landed, and spent a night swapping yarns and drinks with the SSP officers garrisoned at New Oslo. Then we took on a hold full of gallium, and tootaloo to the refrigerated seventh planet. And, this gets tiresome, doesn't it? We accelerated for a day and a half, then Biggs plotted a course, pushed a button, and once again we were freewheeling through colourful and star-spangled space. Life was swell, 
and life was wonderful, and if there was any fly in my celestial ointment, it was the fact that after the first week Lieutenant Romeo, lovesick Biggs, got tired of staring at his fiancée's image, and insisted on strolling up to my turret to tell me, one, what a wonderful girl she was, two, how much he missed her, and three, how he was simply going to die if he didn't see her again soon. Which boring details I had, one, known for years, once having had a heartthrob for Diane myself, two, figured from his conversation, and three, high hopes that he would, quietly. So somehow it was the afternoon, ship's time, of the fourth day of the return shuttle, and Biggs was in my turret, not to mention my hair, and I was hearing for the thousandth time about he wasn't worthy of a gal like Diane, when all of a sudden bells jangled all over the ship, lights flashed the danger signal, and my turret audio broke into frantic voice, and the voice was that of the pilot on duty, our third mate, Bud Wilson. Sparks, is Biggs there? Yes, get him here quick, and find the old man. Hurry, for God's sake. We were out of there like a flash. Make that two flashes, and pounding through the corridors up the ramp to the bridge. We met Cap Hansen on the way. The three of us burst into the control room to find Wilson tearing his hair, and Dick Todd sweating, white-faced, poring over diagrams on the chart board. Somebody yelled, What's the matter? And I can't tell you who, because it was probably all of us. And Dick's eyes were haggard pockets in his face. Jupiter, he said. What about it? yelled the skipper. Talk, man! Todd shoved the chart at Biggs, pointed with a finger that wobbled. It's on a trajectory, right before us now. We can see it. Look! And he threw back the shield, and my heart gave an awful lurch for no longer was the scene before us one of changing iridescent beauty. The entire pane was covered by a gigantic menacing platter, a monstrous missile of death, the planet Jupiter dead on our course. Lancelot Biggs's face, which had been keen and alert a moment before, was suddenly a dull, blank mask of horror. Strangled words fought their way from his throat. I... I didn't realise. I forgot all about Jupiter when I plotted the return course. I... Forgot, roared the skipper. Great comets, forgot! And his wrath died in anxiety. Do something! Turn off that blasted unit of yours so we can loft over her! But Todd shook his head. That's no use, skipper. I thought of that. We're too close. We're caught in a gravitational attraction anyway. Even if we were to turn off Biggs's device, there still wouldn't be time to get the rockets hot. Lance, began the skipper. Then, where did he go? Because Biggs had turned suddenly and raced from the room, fled, still clutching the space chart, fled, and not a word of advice, regret, or hope. And with him went a last dwindling hope of salvation. Dick Todd's voice was thin. Maybe he has an idea, sir? Hansen grasped at the thought as a drowning man. That's it, Todd. He'll pull us out of this. He's never failed us in the past. But even this wishful expression was doomed to swift contradiction. For at that moment the bridge audio flashed, and the voice of a sailor clacked from somewhere below. Captain Hansen, sir, there, there's trouble down here. Lieutenant Biggs has violated regulation, sir. He's knocked down two men and forced his way into the auxiliary lifeboat. He, he's locked the door, sir. What shall we do? In the moment of silence that followed, I saw something I hope I shall never be forced to look upon again. I saw a proud man wilt before my eyes. I saw a strong man age ten years in as many seconds. The man was Captain Hansen. The strength sloughed from his shoulders. Pain burned deep furrows in his eyes. I could barely hear the whisper that crept from his lips. A coward, he husked. The man my daughter loves. A coward. And there was nothing I could say to refute the accusation. 
Lancelot Biggs's action had branded him more damningly than any mere words. A crisis had come, and it had found him wanting. He had deserted his comrades, his ship, and had fled to a lifeboat. Perhaps even now he was getting ready to cast off. In a swift burst of comprehension, I thought I could understand the reason for this last unreasonable defection. Lancelot Biggs had met difficulties before and without flinching. But that was an old, a different Biggs. Love had come into his life now, love and a woman, and all the dreams that happy men dare wish upon. And these things, staunch and noble in themselves, had weakened the moral fibre of Biggs, weakened it to the point where, in the face of danger, nothing was important except that he lived to return to the arms of his loved one. These things I could understand, but I could not forgive them, because love or no love, fear or no fear, a spaceman has a tradition to live up to, and Lancelot Biggs had tossed into the discard the very tradition now upheld by Dick Todd as he said quietly, Shall I advise the men, sir? And by Captain Hansen who said, Yes, Todd, and an order Garrity to cut off Mr. Biggs's intensifier. We may die, but we can die trying to escape, and a slower speed will give us more time. Yes, sir, said Todd, and moved toward the audio. But he had barely reached out his hand toward it when sharp speech rasped from its black throat in remembered tones. Stop, Todd! Don't give that order, Skipper! It was the voice of Lancelot Biggs. Captain Hansen had subdued his rage once, but now his face crimsoned, his great hands clenched, and fury was a ponderable vigour in his voice. You! Where are you, sir? In the life skiff, replied Biggs imperturbably. Almost insolently, I thought, as if he knew he was speaking from the only place of possible security in a doomed ship. "'Todd, do as I say and do it fast. There's no time to lose. Tell Chief Garrity to turn the verniers of my VI unit all the way to the red line on the extreme right. Understand?' Once again Hansen's roar interrupted. "'Come back here, you coward, and die with your fellow officers like the man you once pretended to be.' What do you mean by skulking in a hideaway giving orders aboard my ship? Shut up, bellowed Biggs, and it was not just his audacity in speaking thus to a space commander that shocked me. It was the razor-edged intensity of his voice. Todd, give that order immediately. For God's sake, act. We've no time to lose. Todd's eyes sought mine. He knew as well as I did that the skipper was too furious to give an intelligent command. That's, that's a limiting velocity, Sparks, Todd choked. Biggs must be insane. We'll be translated again into the negative universe, and no way to get back, ever. I didn't have to answer. Biggs answered, I've taken care of that, Todd. Now do as I say. Hurry, hurry. And, well, am I a fool? After all, Lancelot, Biggs and I are old buddies. Once we were bunkmates, even. There came back to me a measure of the confidence I had once had in him, and I nodded to Todd. Try it, Dick. We've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. Give the order. He did. Chief Garrity must have been startled, but he was too good a spaceman to argue an order from the bridge. He said succinctly, Aye, sir, and then I felt the rocking plunge the moment of brief incredible dizziness of frightful speed being intensified to limiting velocity of light. My head whirled, but somehow I managed to turn, stare at that ominous viewpane, and what I saw there brought a shocked cry from my lips. White! White! Dazzling white! Then greyness! No other scene than dim and vacant void, grey, infinite, impenetrable, a glimpse of the lost universe, the matrix negative wherein are flung such mad things as attain a speed beyond that of the limiting velocity. Then crackling across the room agonizedly, 
We're clear, Todd. We're through. And Todd replying dazedly, I, I don't know what you mean. The chronometer, man, has it touched 9.14? Yes, sir, but, but we're slipping into the negative, Lance. We've escaped one death to find another. But there was infinite sadness to Lancelot Biggs's denial. No, you're not, Todd. You're going back to your own universe now. When you feel the ship lurch, turn the VI unit dial back to where it was before. Ready? Now! And there came, inexplicably, a swift unsteadiness, a lurching halt of the ship. At that instant Todd spoke to Garrity, Garrity obeyed, and we were once again travelling smoothly on our proper course. But Jupiter, monstrous missile of solid terrible death, was no longer before us. It was behind us. As we saw that, Captain Hansen laughed aloud, and vast was the joy of that laughter, relief, happiness, sheer triumph, and apology. And he cried, You've done it, son. Forgive me for doubting you. We're safe. I don't know how, but come on in, boy, and tell us all about it. But there came no answer, only the echo of our own harsh breathing, the dry scrape of our own feet shuffling restlessly. A new terror loomed suddenly in the old man's eyes. Biggs, he cried, Lance, my boy, Lance! And then, it was like the faintest winnowed chaff of sound, breathing from afar, far away. A voice speaking to us, a voice that said, Can't come back, Skipper. Sparks will understand. Tell him. Mass energy, relationships, and tell Diane I love. That was all and my brain reeled beneath the import of those fading words. Suddenly, I knew. I didn't need to hear Cap Hansen screaming wild orders to the sailors on the aft deck below, nor to hear their answer. He's not here, sir. He cast off the auxiliary a moment or so ago. I knew. Later, I told them. My explanation was short for the solution was simple. Simple, once you grant that a man can possess infinite loyalty, infinite courage, in one lean and gangling frame. Biggs saw, I said, that there was only one way to save us all from death. Oh, he had blundered, yes, but we all blunder sometimes. But not all of us pay the penalty as willingly, as bravely as he did. Jupiter was upon us, Within minutes we would have crashed into the greatest of the solar planets. Only Biggs saw a way out, and that was to make the speed of our ship exactly approximate the speed of light at the moment of impact. Dick said, but how? He told us the answer. Mass-energy relationships. You know the fundamental theory of the Lawrence Fitzgerald contraction? Objects moving in space are contracted along their major axis in direct proportion to their speed, with a limiting velocity, the speed of light, as their ultimate limit. In other words, at the precise speed of light, this ship existed in only a unilateral dimension. Hansen said, You mean we hurled over Jupiter? No, sir. We went right through it. At that tremendous speed, our dimension extension was zero, hence it did not affect, nor was it affected in any way by, the bulk and mass of Jupiter. It's as though an exceedingly fine wire, moving at lightning speed, were to be propelled through a cake of ice. Only in our case, the wire was of zero dimension, and the cake of ice, Jupiter, did not even recognize that it had been penetrated. But, I shook my head, but Mr. Biggs realised what this daring scheme meant. It meant that in addition to our size being reduced to the infinitesimal, our mass would be raised to the infinite, for that is the corollary of the contraction theory. 
there had to be some way of getting us back to our normal shape and size. The only possible method was by the forcible alteration of our mass. And Biggs adopted this method. He placed himself in the life skiff, gave the necessary orders from there. Then, after the danger had been averted, he deliberately cast off from the Saturn, tossed himself away from us, a living sacrifice to the mathematical gods that we might be safe. Todd said, Our mass for a moment was infinite, but when he, however briefly, broke clear, it became less than infinite, giving us a chance to cut the motors. That's right. Hansen's eyes were round and wild and fearful. But then, where is he? We've got to turn around right away. Find him. We can't go back without... I shook my head. It's no use, Skipper. He may be in this universe, infinitely small, travelling at infinite speed. He may be in some other universe, undreamed by man. He may be living, he may be dead. But wherever he is, he is gone forever from the ken of man. Lancelot Biggs is dead. So far as man is concerned, he is dead. Dick Todd said something then. His words were not clear. They were choked, and he didn't finish the quotation. But I caught the first part. Greater love hath no man, he said. And the skipper coughed, and his eyes were red, and he turned away like a broken, aged man. Amen, he said. Amen. So, Lancelot Biggs is gone. Dead, perhaps, or in another existence, undreamed, unrecognised, by we who spin our fiery tails along the spaceways. And it is a strange, strange thing that he, who of all men looked least like a spaceman, should have lived and died the greatest of them all. Tomorrow, or the next day, I must tell Diane. Hansen would not do it, because he can't. He dares not face her when she hears, and I, myself, would sell my soul to be free of that sad duty. But I was Lancelot Biggs's best friend, and this is the least last thing I can do in his memory. There is nothing else to say. He is gone. Will I ever see him again? That gangling frame, that easy, fluent grin, lost in the nameless depths of the crypts of space. There seems nothing else to say except goodbye. And so I say it to the stars, the far-flung stars amongst which, somewhere, is the finest man I ever knew. Is it goodbye, Mr. Biggs? Or is it only... Au revoir. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. It's just one small click for man. One giant something. <laughs>